So good, after, good afternoon, everyone. This is Paula with Leading Age Virginia. Thank you for being on this webinar today. I want to thank John DiMaggio and his team from Blue Orange Compliance for providing this webinar on telehealth, security, privacy, and compliance around COVID-19. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Paula. And before we get started, I just wanted to hopefully make sure everyone is uh, uh, healthy and safe. And uh, it's a, I know it's a tough tough time out there. I actually have a loved one in a skilled nursing facility and it's just amazing um, everything that's going on and uh, thank you again for everything that you do. So with that, a um, little bit about myself. That's the last time I had a haircut, <laughs> like most of us out there. Uh, so I'm co-founder of Blowers Compliance. Most of my most of my career in a senior living industry, in, a, in the senior living pharmacy business, uh, and uh, started, the, started the company to Help organizations have a practical way through cybersecurity and privacy. Um, also uh, on the call is uh, Kim Klein and Julianne Burns, a part of our uh, HIPAA uh, privacy team. Uh, some of the items that we're going to be talking about today kind of go between uh, privacy, uh, security, and compliance. So uh, they'll be available uh, during the Q and A session. So this is just a little about a little bit about us. Uh, we're a, we're a national firm, uh, very active in leading age. I'm on the CAST Commission. Uh, we work in the cybersecurity and HIPAA privacy space. Some of the things that we do, we're also uh, high trust uh, assessors. So uh, the agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, telehealth. This may be a little bit different uh, bend on telehealth than some of the other um, great sessions that we've seen uh, so far, um, but. Uh, talk about uh, telehealth overview, uh, telehealth and, and COVID uh, regulation around privacy security. Um, we're going to walk through some of the um, some of these uh, material uh, that we're going to provide from you for you, and then we'll have a Q and A session. So uh, also um, there's going to be a little goodie bag I call it. Uh, so we're going to provide you some of the materials that we're reviewing today. Um, Telehealth policy and procedure, which if you don't have one, I think it'd be a great framework uh, to have one. You should have one. Um, and uh, some items about telehealth and COVID uh, that, that are in place uh, temporarily, uh, things you should know. And then also a telework policy and procedure. I'll walk through that uh, if we have time, because uh, um, I know most, most of the folks on this call are kind of essential workers, but I know some some folks, a lot of uh, a lot of the workforce out there, uh, is was pushed uh, to work from home in a very quick manner. So we have uh, some material on that as well. So uh, COVID uh, happened and is happening, right? So we had a uh, extreme pivot, we'll call it, um, from kind of normalcy uh, to uh, workforce working at working from home. Um, the real need uh, for telehealth. Telehealth was uh, has been around for a very long time, um, but suddenly it became uh, very important to keep uh, people apart, right? Um, and make sure um, people didn't have to actually go places and and uh, and um, mix together unnecessarily. So it happened very fast. Um, I think some some uh, beta uh, projects or some that were kind of slow moving. Uh, got moved pretty fast. I know um, from a company standpoint, uh, just sending your whole workforce home um, in a matter of a couple of weeks was a big challenge. I know for uh, most of you who are on the IT staff too, and maybe not so much in um, in help and uh, in your particular um, businesses. Most of you probably um, staying in the office, but happened quickly. So so kind of where are we now? So uh, telehealth. Uh, a lot of you know definitions for that. You know, it's a, a series of, of tools and platforms. Um, it's got a kind of asynchronous bend, and by asynchronous, um, you know, portals for patient education, uh, something where something's available, um, you, uh, you you download something, etc. Uh, but the the main focus right here, what we're going to talk about, is synchronous. So synchronous is I'm having a conversation with you, and um, and you're talking back to me, so it's it's a, it's an ongoing real time conversation. So that's our uh, the definition of of telehealth. I think we're most familiar with uh, two way. It's got to be audio and video. A lot of this is in the um, um, the, the CMS regulations for uh, on the reimbursement, uh, real time, and with the provider at a distant site. So uh, someone's in one place and someone is at a distant site, and I have definitions for that. So that's we're talking about telehealth. 
Um, that's a definition we're using today. Um, so uses, right? Uh, so it's been used you know, a lot in behavioral health, um, you know, uh, communicating back and forth uh, about uh, topics that are, um, you know, mostly verbal. Um, can be used for newer uh, or established residents, right? It's not just for follow-ups, et cetera. Um, transportation issues, right? So especially now, um, having to get health care and trying to figure out how you're going to get there and if it's safe to go to certain places, right? So that's a use for it now to keep uh, keep individuals separated. And then the biggest one, right, is to reduce infection spread, right? To to allow the health care um, function uh, to go on and uh, and make sure that people get the care that they need uh, without having to uh, worry about um, being uh, near each other. So the benefits, um, kind of like um, the, the other slide is, um, obviously uh, increased continuity of care. So, so something, so you don't have to, uh, you know, be apart from your, from your provider uh, hours, right? So if clinic hours are a certain, certain time, you can actually extend those. It's easier to, to engage with, uh, with residents, uh, travel we talked about. Um, rural areas, one of the main, um, you know, reasons uh, healthcare, um, telehealth was started is to service folks in rural communities that don't have access to, you know, all the providers. Um, and uh, so that's, that's another reason for it. There's still some, some issues there with connectivity, which we'll talk about, and the resident experience. So residents can, can stay in their home and not have to uh, unnecessarily, um, you know, move and, and relocate to get health care, then it's a better experience. So there's a couple of different workflows when we're talking about uh, telehealth. Um, one is a provider to a resident. So residents in independent living, they have their own provider um, and they're conducting a telehealth, um, telehealth session um, with, a, with a resident. The other, which we're probably mostly talking about here is a provider to resident that's inside uh, your facility. So this could be a telehealth, um, uh, that's set up with a resident um, in their uh, in their rooms or in a certain location. Uh, it can also be caregiver assisted. We've seen situations where uh, telehealth is being conducted without the actual um, resident um, using this technology, but a caregiver uh, um, is, is assisting. And actually, we had a, a question um, like that from one of our uh, our clients that when the you know the regulations came out about that you can use some of these other technologies we'll talk about um, that uh, physicians and nurses wanted to communicate with Skype and some of the other things so uh, so those regulations were about um, uh, telehealth uh, between the provider uh, and a resident as long as the caregiver is assisting that process and that's okay uh, the other which we've seen um, in some um, uh, provider settings is you go to your local um, um, uh, physician office and there's a specialist in another office in another state, right? So you can come in actually to the, uh, the provider practice and see someone who is actually has a special uh, specialist. We see that a lot of uh, oncology and, and specialty areas. So there are some, some of the workflows. Uh, can be a, a new encounter or existing, some of the uh, reimbursement we'll talk about a little bit uh, has changed about and opened up. Um, but for, for a good, you know, telehealth system, uh, other functions around um, provider experience, registration, scheduling, um, and many are probably in some shape or form looking at the pure uh, telehealth solutions or uh, using some of the uh, temporary ones. But those are some of the other functions that can be involved, especially you know, integrations with your EHR, et cetera. Um, so here's some of the, uh, the barriers, um, you know, current and past, some, some of these still exist. Uh, reimbursement has been an issue, right? Because that kind of drives, drives um, uh, a lot of what, what we do, um, we need to get paid for it, right? So uh, there's some um, uh, barriers for reimbursement, licensing, regulatory, um, you know, scaling and logistics. Um, now with the uh, emergency that happened, um, some of those barriers have been um, you know, knocked down temporarily, right? So say, the temporarily means um, now, right? <laughs> we don't know when that's going to end. Uh, but reimbursement, um, you know, it can be from uh, um, multiple uh, locations, more services, uh, reducing the um, uh, some of the barriers to get reimbursement. So now um, we can get paid uh, for those functions as well. So that's one of the barriers removed. And regulatory, uh, which we'll talk a lot about here, um, is um, the ability to use different types of technology if you don't have a full, um, you know, 
Facebook compliant telehealth um, uh, setup set up there. And consent, notice, privacy practice, some of the other things that, that we'll talk about. So those barriers have been removed. So you know you drive that with the need, and uh, telehealth has really has really taken off quickly. Um, so why telehealth now? Obviously, COVID is, is the big driver, reimbursement, and then infrastructure. I mean, not since you know, fairly recently have you kind of taken for granted that most folks in, in their homes can really get uh, some um, uh, decent uninterrupted uh, video um, at a good quality. I know, um, you know, personally, I'm at a home, I, my, my kids are, are uh, uh, doing a video from, from school, got Netflix going on, and still I'm able to hop on a Zoom meeting and not have any issues rather than, hey, you know, turn off the TV, et cetera. So, so that is another uh, reason why I think telehealth, um, telehealth has taken off. Um, so uh, all those things make it, uh, make it a, a, a great thing that we're, you know, it's, a, it's uh, you know, nothing like emergency to, to accelerate change management, right? So we're thinking about it, now we're there, and I think it's going to, to stay, right? It's in a lot of ways, it's a better way to provide healthcare now some of these barriers are gone, and how many stick or not is, is uh, we'll talk about that as well. Um, so uh, concepts and terms. Uh, so now versus soon. So now is we're going through the emergency now. Soon is whenever this emergency is over and things you should be considering now. Okay, so there's some of the concepts. Uh, good faith um, is in a lot of the um, HIPAA regulations. Um, so we'll talk about uh, about that. That whatever you're doing, it's not a um, it's not just a uh, kind of wild west. Is you know all the uh, you know, there's no more police in town. Do what do what you want. You have to have good reasons to to um, to engage in some of these some of these exceptions. And then this allowed versus notification of enforcement discretion. So we'll talk about that more. But that's um, you know when you say that some of these technologies are allowed, um, like uh, Skype and some of those other things, um, the regulations haven't changed. But all they're doing is telling you that there's going to be enforcement discretion. During the national emergency, there's an discretion. There's a discretion for enforcement. So there's a difference there between regulations have changed and um, they won't be uh, won't be able to uh, won't uh, punish you as they would normally. Um, and there's the concept of reasonable security practices. It's a it's a, a legal term about the basics that you should have in security, and that comes into play for a lot of these things. So so these are some of the concepts and terms terms we'll be going um, utilizing for the rest of this. Um, so uh, HIPAA, um, telehealth, and COVID. Um, I'm going to share one of our alerts that you'll get to, but it has um, some great um, uh, Q&A functions uh, and some other things that will be helpful. I'll go through it briefly, and then, as I said, you'll uh, you'll get this um, you will get this uh, as part of your uh, goodie bag. So, a definition of what of what telehealth is, at least uh, defined by by HHS, right, and use of um, um, uh, the technologies, et cetera. Um, what entities are included? So basically, uh, um, entities that are covered by HIPAA. Okay, so this is, uh, is we're all in um, following this from uh, healthcare providers. Um, what patients? Any patient doesn't matter whether they're Medicare or Medicaid um, can can utilize um, telehealth under the under these guidelines. Um, which part uh, of of the regs um, are, are discretion? So. So this is, you won't be subject to penalties for violations um, if you're in good faith provision. So we'll talk about what that means. Um, and uh, obviously it doesn't affect um, HIPAA outside of, uh, of telehealth during, during emergency. Um, so if you're part of SAMHSA, so if you are a substance abuse, uh, these, um, uh, Modific these modifications or uh, discretion areas do not apply to that, so you can't use those for that. Um, uh, for enforcement discretion, um, it is in place until they say it's over. Um, so we're still we're still living that. Um, where can you uh, provide it? Um, you want to be in a private setting. Um, if a private setting isn't available, um, you have to have a good reason why. Again, that's in good faith. Um, uh, covered by uh, enforcement discretion and remote telecommunications. So, um, so this is all about uh, coverage. Um, this is examples of bad faith that are opposite of good faith, right? So, um, and we'll talk more about uh, good faith, but here's the things you definitely cannot do. 
Um, public facing um, remote communications product, which you can use. So um, these are some of the ones usually have end to end encryption. So Hangouts, uh, Skype, Zoom, um, there's ones that you that are public facing like TikTok, Facebook, Facebook uh, Live, et cetera. So those are the ones are not that are are not uh, are not allowed. So again, it has to be in good faith, and and we'll go we'll go through that. But here's a, a pretty good um, guide for you. You can give it to your uh, your privacy folks, uh, et cetera, um, about uh, um, kind of the basics that are needed for all this technology. So you'll you'll uh, be getting a copy of this. Uh, I just wanted to walk through that so you can get to the rest of your team. Um, the next uh, topic is HIPAA compliant applications. So, uh, so for this, you know, when you're looking for a telehealth um, vendor, right, um, outside of the emergency, you want something that's HIPAA compliant. And just because an application is HIPAA compliant, um, you know, that means that they've signed a business associate agreement, which means that they are um, um, are attesting that they have all the components of the HIPAA security role. Okay. So that's their end of it. Um, so that's some things you do. You always you always your vet, vet your vendors too. But in order to operate it in a HIPAA compliant way, it's kind of up to you, right? So um, you want to have um, you know implementation. Uh, think about implementation and operation from configuring uh, the environment. If it's not uh, configuration isn't set correctly, and you're not authorizing people to use it, your folks aren't trained um, you should have policies and procedures so just because uh and this isn't the first HIPAA compliant um, application that you'll be dealing with you have money in your organization but um when you're looking at hipaa uh from a hipaa compliant standpoint at least for telehealth look for these things but you want to make sure that you um, integrate them into your security program and have them be another piece of your technology have all these guidelines around to it because i say these these systems are HIPAA capable only you can uh, operate them in a HIPAA compliant way. Um, so with with telehealth, um, you want to uh, you know treat this as another kind of core piece of technology. Um, and also, I mean, even the temporary standpoint, you need to consider all these things. So include it in your cybersecurity program, right? You should have a cybersecurity program. Um, determine uh, as you're um, you know figuring this out for the soon and long term, right? What are your requirements? How are you going to use it? Um, what workflows? I mean, this is all kind of part of um, evaluating uh, systems for purchase and implementation. Um, you know, policies and procedures around it. You want to assess uh, the risk of this uh, technology um, into your uh, into your operation, and um, um, that is going to be different from these um, you know these temporaries that you're these uh, technologies that you're um able to use in the short term uh, versus long term um, look at your platforms um, as part of your security program you should have a, a security plan um, and uh, do risk assessments and all these as, as part of this so so you want to integrate this into it especially um, even if you're using these um, uh, these uh, uh, temporary technologies um, so here are some uh, if you have clients on the phone you're kind of familiar with this um, here's some um, kind of control, uh, security control examples that you want to look at from a, um, a telehealth standpoint. First of all, training. So you want to be able to uh, train uh, train your, your folks who are using it, who are administering it, um, and especially with uh, something, if it's, a, if it's a new process, I'm sure everybody knows how it is, not only just in operations, but how to operate it securely um, and uh, under what circumstances. Um, who has access to it? Who's allowed to use this application as part of your access control um, um, uh, group here? Um, so uh, that can probably be established from, um, uh, from a management standpoint, who's able to operate telehealth uh, and these technologies. Um, you want to make sure uh, that you know whoever is participating in these is actually them, right? Um, so ways to confirm uh, to confirm uh, identity, um, and you'll see I think down the road from um, you know security regulations on the HIPAA side, you'll probably uh, be a requirement to validate um, who is actually uh, participating in the interaction. 
uh, make sure that they were them. Um, audit, um, be able to look at these uh, these interactions and and determine uh, kind of when they happened. Uh, again, were they uh, with uh, uh, legitimate members, et cetera, and be able to to go back and see if there's any um, sessions that are going on without your knowledge, that type of thing. Incident response uh, is another area. Uh, what are some what are some security incidents that may happen in this, and how would you handle them? Um, another big one is risk assessment. You guys are doing uh, risk assessments uh, on a regular basis um, for good security practice, and also from um, HIPAA. Uh, for HIPAA requirement, so these are things to take a look at um, when you're um, when you're going through and adopting these uh, telehealth um, technologies, either you know, in temporary or your longer term ones. Um, we actually had um, um, a, a client that actually was implementing telehealth, and uh, the, the the doctors and, and and nurses felt like it was much easier to jump to the other technology. So that would be a uh, a case where you'd have to uh, have a reason why, uh, because you know one of the major things about uh, HIPAA is um, is that it's it's for patients and healthcare patients, right? So that comes first, and and your residents. So that should never get uh, HIPAA should never get in the way of that. But you have to uh, again do you know take care of that responsibly. Which brings us to good faith. So good faith is used um, in the uh, in the regulations, right? For for some of these ones that are um, that are um, temporarily allowed. So honest, sincere, and reasonable attempt to do something. So um, you know, in other ways, you know, could you come? Could you look at someone in a straight face and say why you're doing this? So here's an example um, using one of the non-compliant pl platforms that are that are uh, that are available. Um, not just because, hey, they're easy to use, but I have a valid reason. So here might be a, a um, an argument, and these are one of the things you want to you want to document uh, through all these things, as far as why you're doing something, the reasons why, et cetera. So, so, uh, so reason, you know, you don't have a platform, but you're in the process of getting one, uh, HIPAA compliant platform, and here's the time frame. It's 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 what you're doing. This happened, but you're operating in this way. Um, and you have to operate uh, telehealth because you have high risk, um, high risk residents, and um, and you don't want to put the people together, right? So that could be a reason. Um, and even though these uh, applications aren't HIPAA compliant, from a mitigation standpoint, um, you know, talk about um, you know one of the um, security areas is, is minimum use, right? To make sure that people are given the minimum amount of access to to do their jobs, right? So. Uh, so you're limiting people only to authorize. Um, you've, you're training people uh, on the security controls and letting them um, know uh, um, things that are new. Um, this stuff has been set up properly. Uh, we actually have a, um, an alert I'll show you uh, to, to walk you through um, some of those things and, uh, and when you started using it, right? So, so th the more kind of documentation and your reasoning of how you're, um, uh, you're in good faith um, you have to kind of deviate from the HIPAA compliant. You're, you're, you're using some of these other technologies that are um, uh, that have uh, enforcement discretion. Uh, but this is a good practice, uh, so you can talk about your reason and ways that you're trying to do the best you can with it, right? So uh, versus, I'm just going to do it for for no reason um, or uh, or non valid reason. So this is an important concept um, through all this. Um, Reasonable uh, security practices. So um, this is a um, again, it's a uh, it's a legal term, um, but as you read it, you know, so so basic, uh, you know, failure to implement them is evidence that you're not reasonable. Okay, <laughs> so it's kind of a, a kind of a recursive, but but basically, um, from a healthcare industry standpoint, uh, there's regulations and um, that, that talk about this in New York, uh, et cetera, that. Um, you have to have reasonable security practices, and if you're in a regulated um, uh, industry such as governed by HIPAA, those are reasonable security practices because because we're, we're in healthcare, we're covered by HIPAA. We have to at least meet the HIPAA um, um, low water line, um, and those are reasonable enough. So you have to have your um, if you meet HIPAA and you know you're consistently meeting and not just doing your assessments, but you have all your controls and in place have a good security program, those could be considered reasonable security practices. But I bring this up because um, uh, just because 
uh, you're allowed to 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 operate this um, in, in discretion and not be in hot water for HIPAA. Uh, you could be subject to other other regulations that may have this reasonable security practices um, definition attached to them, um, which is where we are here. So, um, so we talked about state regulations. Um, so you want to look at your state regs. There's more and more state regs now that um, that protect uh, personally identifiable information, which um, um, protected health information um, is a is a subset of so that's that's PII. Um, so obviously, if you have health information, you have, you have that plus all your employee information and personally identifiable information. So those regulations might be um, might be in place as well. Uh, for these, so just because um, it's a um, HIPAA is not enforcing it, uh, you want to make sure that you you know all your regulations that you're following. And civil actions is kind of a um, uh, kind of a, a, a tricky one, but you know, for example, if you are um, uh, something does happen and and your stuff from a, from telehealth using one of these technologies ends up um, in the on a dark web. Um, could uh, could someone come after you? Um, anybody can sue anybody for anything. Uh, and I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not your lawyer. Uh, but those could come into play, um, even if you're um, even if you're uh, complying uh, with HIPAA. Um, so you want to make sure you have reasonable security practices. Um, so right now uh, we're going to take a uh, little um, journey through a telehealth policy, which you'll uh, get, will be getting here. So this is uh, a, a policy and procedure um, from a, uh, that, that will provide you. This is, a, if you're our customer, should look, should look familiar. Um, but, uh, but like uh, every policy procedure, it has all its, um, all the, all the key areas. Um, and uh, the scope is you know, about your workforce members and how you're going to handle telehealth. So here's from policy statements. Um, if you don't have one of these, you should probably have, have a policy and you can take this and modify it for your own purposes. But has to have to uh, adhere to HIPAA. Um, you have to make sure you're allowed to do it by HHS and, and the regulations. Um, you get the proper consent um, that you need. Um, so um, emergency situation. This one here is um, this is your uh, kind of outlet here that in in COVID this is an emergency situation. Um, so you will be able to um, you should have other language of what you're doing in the emergency. So this policy and procedure still stands for telehealth and it will it will stand after the emergency. But this gives the ability so you don't have to modify this is to come up with them. Um, uh, with uh, with temporary um, language, state and local guidelines, um, uh, and um, obviously have all the tracking uh, required. So getting down to the procedures, you saw procedures are with your policies here, um, benefits for your patients, um, for billing and reimbursement, um, all the technologies that you're using um, uh, from telehealth vendors uh, must have BAA. Now this is the one and another one also that during this emergency um, in your emergency language you can say what you're using and why. Um, so that would be a good place for that. Um, you have to uh, advise them about uh, using telehealth potential risk, um, document uh, the services for, for CMS. It's very good to document all these um, interactions and who's uh, who's part of them uh, as well. Um, and again, HIPAA compliant uh, telecommunications um, and, and uh, the requirements about real-time real -time audio, um, record keeping. Um, from a security standpoint, um, you wanna make sure that they have end-to-end uh, -end communication uh, encryption. Um, those uh, a good HIPAA compliant um, uh, telehealth system you get. But even in the, in the, for the temporary standpoint, that's a requirement. Um, client with HIPAA from a security standpoint, uh, what you can't use, never allowed. Um, uh, best practices, uh, HIPAA compliant messaging, um, uh, storage. These are good, pra uh, good best practices that you can um, integrate with the rest of your uh, security policies and procedures, uh, encryption. Again, you'll be getting this. Uh, if you have any questions, you can let us know. And this is just a um, standard for exception handling. Uh, 
definitions and obviously distribute to your workforce members. So this should be in your same policy procedure format followed by just another one that you should have. Um, and this is a good thing to have also. So these are the uh, components of the HIPAA regulations that this uh, policy and procedure touches. So, uh, so this will be part of your goodie bag um, here. I think it'd be a great, if you don't have one of these, it'd be a great foundation to have one because you should have one for this technology that you're probably using now and will probably use um, in, the, in the long term. Uh, no questions at the end. Um, now, alerts. So we have um, several alerts that we've we sent out to um, uh, to clients, um, uh, and uh, we'll go over some of these. You'll get these as well. Um, this so this is um, devices for resident um, uh, for patient or resident use here. So, um, so what to look for uh, for giving um, devices to your resident? These are usually short. Uh, and you can um, distribute these to your workforce or wherever you think um, should know this. This is usually from, from your standpoint, um, uh, not for your residents, but there's great information out here. Make sure you um, inventory it. Um, um, these remote devices um, prevent theft, et cetera. So these are, these are good things to, uh, to have in place. Um, teleconference hijacking, you've seen a lot about um, Zoom bombing, uh, et cetera, um, especially if you're going to be using Zoom and some of other technologies uh, about hijacking since the information um, in these telehealth sessions is, um, uh, is, um, is, is very confidential. Um, and what it is, um, tips around it, don't share publicly, um, settings for your Zoom, Zoom meeting, uh, make sure you have a waiting room and check people in, uh, et cetera. So, these are, uh, this is another good um, uh, alert uh, to have and to share with your folks. Um, this is uh, remote devices best practices. So, um, so there's a lot of uh, devices that are floating around remotely. So you wanna have a good inventory. Um, and again, for these remote devices that are leaving your building and, and maybe um, haven't been before, um, um, training and things around around uh, these devices. This is uh, phishing. So phishing is always is always an issue, but um, during COVID, um, we're starting to see that a lot more. Um, and taking advantage of folks that are not in their normal work environment, right? They are um, they are uh, many are at home. Um, and there's a lot of COVID news going back and forth. So people are interested in, in getting information and maybe clicking on things or want more information. Here's a, a phishing alert. This is something you probably can get out to uh, the workforce and your, uh, and your residents as well. Um, I said I would, uh, if we have time, which we do, um, here's another policy and procedure we can give you. This is for teleworking. So as we said, uh, the, uh, a lot of the workforce, uh, a lot of industries has been, has been pushed out um, and teleworking was you know, just for a few folks that are always kind of out and about. Uh, but you know, for for major, um, uh, a lot of, of folks are now out and about. So here's a good policy: um, if you have um, if if you have folks out and maybe on an ongoing basis they'll be out more. Um, but again, um, policy statements more about um, who's able to be um, uh, to be a remote remote worker. Um, and, uh, you know, things, you know, their responsibilities as, um, uh, if you're working from home, it's, it's the same, it's the same deal. Um, obviously the emergency, um, clause in there, um, uh, you've not, everyone's not automatically able, able to work there. Um, uh, they can revoke privileges as you, the company, um, uh, demonstrate, you can provide you know, still be able to do your job because um, these are things and policies and procedures that you'll you'll need, especially for you know one of the things policies and procedures are are um, really required for are sanctions, right? If uh, if it's not in a policy procedure, you can't sanction someone for not following it. So, um, and what their expectations are, again, um, um, you know, if uh, you should track everything that leaves uh, to make sure it comes back, and you know what equipment is. That was formerly there is not there, especially if people are taking um, their equipment um, their equipment home. Um, 
you could, uh, you know, maybe flex schedules, maybe not flex schedules. Um, PTO is still in effect. Um, if you're working from home, you still have to ask for it. So it, uh, we're trying to do is make, um, you know, plan for the, uh, the exceptions, uh, but also um, what is expected of, of your um, teleworking folks too. Um, from a security standpoint, um, uh, security um, uh, you know, authorized, uh, what they're authorized to do. Um, controls are in place. Um, how to set up uh, set up internet. Now, if you are remote, uh, you should have some type of uh, VPN or some type of secure um, secure connection. Uh, a lot of seeing a lot of cyber attacks um, on on folks that are at home and depending on their their home network and their technology. Uh, or their personal equipment, right? So this personal equipment has, needs to be authorized um, by IT to make sure it has all the right equipment or if it's company owned, how you connect to the internet. So these are all the things um, that uh, should have in place. And again, this is a great policy um, for having folks um, that you need to have out of the office. And even if you don't have a policy like this and you have sales for most marketing folks, they should have, um, you should have a policy like this for those folks. So, uh, so that is telework. Um, that's going to be included in your um, package as well. Um, and with that, um, we wanted to open it up for questions. Um, these are some of the material. Uh, here's a link. Uh, we can go and grab those. Uh, we have those ready for you to download. Um, and at this point, uh, we can open it up for questions. Yeah, John, I don't see anything in the chat box. So if y'all want to ask him a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. If you're on the phone, you'll have to hit star six. Hey John, can you go into some of the cons uh, security concerns about telehealth, um, being that it's opening up different, um, you know, surface areas for a uh, for a network? Yeah, I mean for for telehealth, um, if it's between, uh, let me see, if it's between a um, uh, if someone is at their home or another another environment. Um, from a telehealth standpoint, that could be uh, an issue, um, especially if it's if you're using some of these other technologies like uh, Zoom and Skype, et cetera. Um, in general, um, even from a telework standpoint, um, being in a an environment, I think from if you're at a at a physician to a to a facility, um, if you're on the corporate network, that might not be uh, that big of an issue. Uh, on a guest network, uh, maybe another issue. So it um, it does uh, introduce some kind of unfamiliar um, networking areas for us from a security standpoint. Any questions or comments? I know you IT people are quiet people, but <laughs> you've got to have some question. <laughs> Okay, I guess not. Well, John and your team, I know you are all on the call as well. I appreciate this information. I thought it was great. And thank you for um, allowing those members that were on the call to get your goodie bag and all that stuff. I think that would be great for them, great resources for them, um, all the stuff, things that they probably 
have or might not have or have been considering, especially in light of COVID and all that that has brought about with regard to security and everything like that. So um, thank you all for being on the call today and y'all have a good day. And thank you, John. And thank you, um, Julianne and Dan and Kim. Appreciate your help in all of this and putting this together for us.